Well, it's Tuesday the 8th of June and you are most welcome to this talk. Now, there hasn't been a lot published so far on the effect of uh, COVID-19 in adolescence. So we're going to deal with that in a little detail in this uh, video. And it's going to be based on a Centers for Disease Control report on hospitalizations in adolescence. Now, of course, I always put the link in. Check it out for yourself. This is the actual paper here. Um, there seems to be lots of people do writing at the CDC. So there's at least 23 authors listed there. And it's got all the uh, information here. There's a headline thing at the top and uh, they've got the graphics there that they like. But uh, we'll, we'll come on to that. Let's look, let's look at it in a little more, uh, a little more detail now. Um, I don't know if there's a bottom line to this video, really. Um, I suppose the bottom line is that the risk to adolescence of hospitalisation is, is uh, relatively small compared to older age groups, of course, but it's most certainly still there. And the, the CDC are definitely using this as part of their um, campaign to encourage Americans to be vaccinated. Now, we did mention yesterday the vaccine that's authorised for use in adolescence, adolescence in the States is the, is the Pfizer vaccine. Um, which is currently licensed and, and, and probably will be in a lot of other places fairly soon as well. Um, the data is probably not going to vary that much from country to country, I wouldn't have thought. So here's the report. Um, <clears throat> now, they're defining adolescence as 12 to 17. So, OK, that sounds reasonable. So um, COVID hospitalisation rates amongst adolescents declined in January and February uh, as cases went down generally in the state. So that is pretty well what you'd expect. We've noticed this gradual decline now in the States for for some months. Um, but so adolescent, adolescent cases, let's stick the, to the point, adolescent cases January and February went down, then the increased in March and April. We don't have data for May yet, but the trend goes up to April that we know of as well. Now, what are the factors here involved? Well, there's um, uh, the new variants, of course. Now, um, we know that the UK B117 alpha variant, we have to give variants so many names these days that to be, try and be correct, probably we shouldn't bother. But anyway, the UK Kent variant, more transmissible than the old variant by about 40-50%. The India variant, the Delta variant, 40% um, more transmissible than the UK variant. Now, people have asked me where I got that information from. It's not published yet. It's simply a statement in the House of Commons by the Health Secretary, Matt Hancock. But uh, we can assume he's well informed. He's got things wrong in the past, but we can assume he can uh, co co read out a statement that said it's 40% more transmissible, obviously, from his, from his scientists. So that's where that was from. Um, so put these things together and we can get more transmission in all age groups, of course, but particularly return to school, particularly behavioural change, reduce mask wearing, greater amounts of mixing. Uh, that is the link that we've just looked at there. Uh, severe disease that requires hospitalisations occurs in all age groups, this report says, and there is some risk of multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children. Well, that's the name. That's the name of the condition. Multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children, but this can occur in adolescents as well. Now, the CDC report does not give numbers on this, but it notes that it can occur. And of course, the thing that struck me reading this was in the United States, of course, these patients are all well looked after. Um, in countries like uh, India, where the health services were overwhelmed, then um, presumably some younger people have died through lack of hospital care, but not in the States, thankfully. Uh, there has been some death through uh, uh, paediatric uh, multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children, but no deaths from COVID in adolescence in this report, but th that is time limited. Let's, uh, anyway, we'll carry on. Uh, COVID-19 associated hospitalizations. Now this first data here is uh, January uh, to March. So all of January, February, and all of March. Uh, CDC's COVID-19 Associated Surveillance Network. Now, they go into quite a lot of detail on this in the, uh, in the paper, if you, want, if you want to look at it. They, they tell you about that a lot, and there seems to be uh, hundreds of people working for them. It seems to be a pretty big uh, organisation. There's a list of... Oh, let's have a look, actually. There's a list of so many names here that... that uh, yeah, the, 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 there's there's the acknowledgements and there's the COVID net surveillance team. There's loads of them. So, so uh, 
<laughs> don't seem to be understaffed anyway okay so th that's all the people involved in this um in this covid19 associated surveillance network okay better to be thorough uh, now, laboratory confirmed cases of COVID-19 hospitalizations, and this data comes from 99 counties across 14 states. So this is not a survey of the whole country. It is just these uh, these uh, 14 states and 99 counties that they're collecting data from. But that does cover about 10 percent of the population of the United States. So it's a pretty good sample size, pretty good sample size. Now, in this group... And now the way they've written this article, actually, I, I've read it a few times now. It's not entirely clear if they're saying that these numbers are for this cohort, but I think it must be for this cohort. So as far as I can tell from reading this paper, these are the numbers for that cohort representing the 99 counties, 14 states, 10% uh, of the population of the United States. Um so they noticed that there was 376 hospitalizations in adolescents, that's 12 to 17 year olds, with a positive test. So 376 admissions. But when they looked at these admissions in detail, they could only say that 204 of them were definitely for COVID-19. So this, the rest in this group um, would be admitted to hospital. They did have a positive diagnosis of COVID-19, um, but... Um, that they were in hospital primarily for other reasons. The, the, the definitions on that weren't clear, but they were happy to say that these 204 were in primarily for COVID. Now, the next but is quite a big one, really. Um, although these numbers are relatively small, because you've got to remember this is representing 10% of the adolescents in the United States, the number that hospitalised are relatively small, but the number that required uh, intensive care, of that, the proportion of those 204 was relatively large. Um, so um, of, of these 204, so of the 204, 64 adolescents, that relates to 31.4% of them, were admitted to ICU. So we see that nearly a third of this 204 actually became quite poorly. So even though they're not likely to be admitted in the first place, or not very likely to be admitted in the first place, if they were admitted, their chances of deteriorating and needing more specialist care were reasonably high, 31.4%. Uh, I think there was actually 10 of them. It works out at 4.9% required invasive mechanical ventilation. So again, thankfully, the numbers are small, but not uh, an insignificant proportion of the number of the 204 that were originally hospitalised for reasons of COVID-19. Thankfully, no associated deaths, but in countries without equivalent health services, and we can think of many, many places, um, most African countries, most Asian countries, and quite a few um, South American countries, the care wouldn't be as good. And um, we can I think I think it's reasonable to assume that the ones that required intensive care, and certainly the ones that required mechanical ventilation, would probably have died without the care that they received. But thankfully, this data is from the United States and there were no, um, no, no associated deaths in adolescents from these 204 people that were hospitalised. So um, good positive mark for the health care that they received. Now, what about the risk factors? Well, among the 204 patients, female 52.5, so reasonably even split between uh, males and females. But uh, we see that Hispanics or Latino and uh, non-Hispanic blacks were greatly uh, overrepresented compared to the number in the population. So um, even accounting for the states where there's higher Hispanic and Latino populations, this remains true. So um, and it did occur to me that these are the groupings in the United States that we know as the we know are lowest on vitamin D. Um, We've looked at data on that many times in the past. Uh, black, Amer black Americans and Hispanic or Latino Americans much more likely to be low on vitamin D compared to um, white Americans. This was not mentioned at all in the report, which I considered to be an omission, but it wasn't mentioned. Uh, in fact, they didn't really say why. They didn't really go into the uh, thinking behind why these groups were... Um, I keep clicking the wrong one. Why these groups were overrepresented. Um, 
I mean, re- actually, you can read through this in a few minutes yourself. It's not it's not a massive read. It's it's intelligible. Um, it's a professionally written paper, but it is written for the. It's not written for a scientific audience. I think is, is probably the the CDC's uh, philosophy on this. Um, uh, 70% <clears throat> had one or more underlying medical conditions. Okay, so you would kind of expect that. Quite a lot of obesity, quite a lot of chronic lung disease, including chronic asthma, fair amount of neurological disease. So reflecting the uh, the comorbidity risk factors in the older population, really, that we've known about for a long time now. Um, but... Nevertheless, 30% reported no underlying condition. So, um, yes, underlying health conditions are a risk factor. Um, Does it mean that healthy adolescents can't be hospitalised? No, healthy adolescents can be hospitalised, although at a lower rate. And again, the reason I'm going through this in detail is this is the first time we've had this kind of detailed information on adolescents, so it's worth... It's worth knowing where we stand. I think, and globally, this is this is going to be okay. This is this is this is a United States survey, but there's no reason to particularly expect the disease process would affect adolescents in different countries particularly differently. So it has got probably some applicability in in other areas. COVID nineteen associated adolescent hospitalizations rates twelve point five times lower than the collective over eighteen age group. So good. Uh, but nothing new there. <clears throat> we, we know that we know they're much less likely to be hospitalised. Adolescent hospital rates com- were comparable to naught to four year olds, but higher than those amongst children aged five to eleven. In other words, children aged five to eleven have got the very lowest rate of hospital admission. Slightly higher rates in the naught to four year olds, comparable with the twelve to seventeen year olds that we are defining as uh, adolescents for the purposes of this study. Now, October the 1st, 2020 to April uh, 2021. So that's basically over the over the, the influenza winter season, isn't it? COVID-19 admissions, uh, 2.5 to 3 times higher than influenza-associated hosp- hospitalisation rates. So 2.5 to 3 times more people admitted with COVID-19 compared to ordinary seasonal influenza. That number's probably not too surprising, not too surprising. And then, uh, as we've looked at before, um, CDC, of course, like their nice graphics. There we can see the coloured version. So 204 adolescents hospitalised. Um, nearly a third required admission to ICU. 5% required mechanical ventilation. Thankfully, none died. Uh, it says here, adolescents aged 12 to 17 years now eligible to get a COVID vaccine. Just the Pfizer one, though, I think, at the moment. Uh, and CDC here report, uh, vaccination protects against severe illness, allows kids to safely join group activities, is safe and free. So that is from the, uh, like, uh, it's like these credit card size things they put out for the, uh, for the Centres for Disease Control. So no uh, no uh, ambiguity there that the Centres for Disease Control is advocating vaccination. Now, what, what are other people saying about this? Always interesting to see what the pundits are saying. Uh, Centres for Disease Control uh, Director Rochelle Walinsky. Direct quotes. I'm deeply concerned by the number of hospitalised adolescents and saddened to see the number of adolescents who require treatment in intensive care or mechanical ventilation. And throughout the country, this will add up to quite a few. So... Yes, I can I can see why she's saying that. That makes sense. Much of this suffering can be prevented. Vaccination is our way out of this pandemic. Direct quotes. I continue to see promising signs in CDC data that we're nearing the end of this pandemic in this country. So it's sort of light at the end of the tunnel. Sounds good. However, we all have to do our part and get vaccinated to cross the finish line. So that's... Uh, from the director, uh, Michelle, uh, what's her name? Uh, Rochelle, Rochelle Wolinsky. Okay. Andrew Paver, Professor of Paediatrics Infectious Diseases, Utah University. Um, 
Flu very rarely causes long-term symptoms and organ damage, unlike COVID-19. Now, this is, is also a big risk, the risk of long COVID. And again, we don't have figures on this in this report. But um, we know that the um, Office for National Statistics in the UK is now reporting on long COVID features and it was more prevalent than we thought. We'll have an update on that soon, actually. The Office for National Statistics has reported yesterday or today, so there'll be an update on that shortly. Uh, but there is going to be some burden of morbidity for some period of time after this pandemic due to long COVID. Um, organ damage, particularly, these patients may not recover, at least fully. So... Um, this professor again, adolescents have many reasons to get vaccinated as soon as possible, including their own health. The ability to help control COVID-19 amongst more vulnerable groups, in other words, they'll contribute towards herd immunity. And the ability to return to normal life for everyone. Uh, and then a fairly hopeful one to finish off with, uh, David Rubin, Director of Policy Lab Children's Hospital Philadelphia, who we've heard of a few times. You may see some vestiges of outbreaks in particular areas that have lower vaccination rates. So again, certainly advocating vaccination in terms of preventing overall outbreaks. But this is commenting on the reduced incidence in the states generally. Uh, but these outbreaks will be harder to sustain themselves and actually grow into these major outbreaks that they were discussing. So basically immunity is increasing in the states, which is good news. And the trajectory in the states is still um, reasonably good although as uh, Dr uh, Walensky says um, we all have to do our part to get vaccinated, va vaccinated to cross the finish line she's saying we are not quite there yet okay so short update today um, hope that helped um, definitive figures really for the first time on uh, adolescent risks and uh, Clear, clear encouragement there from the Centres for Disease Control supporting the vaccination programme. Thank you for watching.